Coming up on today's show. It doesn't matter whether it's Democrat, Republican, Independent. This is not just about stopping abortions, but also providing resources to the woman who has the child so that future she dreamed of prior to the pregnancy can still be achieved. Peace be with you. This is Catholic Sports Radio, located at the intersection of your faith life and sports life, and on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and lots and lots of other platforms. I am Bruce Wozniak, talking with Catholic guests who are current or former athletes, coaches, referees, umpires, clergy, administrators, and more from the pro, amateur, and scholastic ranks about the intersection of their faith life and their sports life. The show website is catholicsportsradio.net or .com. They will both get you to the same place. Be sure that you have signed up there for free for the Catholic Sports Radio e-newsletter that gets sent out each Monday. That's it. I'm not going to bombard you with emails just once a week when a new episode comes out. While you are on the website signing up for the newsletter, look at the top of any page on the site, and you will see social media links, logos for this show meaning Facebook, X, Instagram, and YouTube, so that you can engage with me and the show that way. The Catholic Sports Radio community, that is the name of the Facebook group, consisting of listeners of this show and some past guests. That is free to join, and you can also find a link for that as well on catholicsportsradio.net. I truly enjoy hearing from listeners. Social media, as well as the website, all give you the opportunity to contact me as does traditional email, which you can do through bruce at catholicsportsradio.net. Now on to my ministry moment for this episode. In sports, it's not uncommon to see a player get traded and then, as luck would have it, a game against his now former team comes up on the schedule sooner than later. Fans will watch that traded away player during pregame warm-ups to see if there is any conversation with his now former teammates. It's natural to wonder where their loyalties lie, especially when it's someone who had been playing for one team for a long time. The challenge is to move on and stay true to your new team and show them that you can be counted on not only in the game, but in situations like I'm describing away from play. This could even happen to any of us in changing say, coaching jobs or a non-sports 9-to-5 job where there might be a competitor that you go to. It's about being a good Christian and not bad-mouthing those you used to work alongside and showing you are committed to where you are. The Lord sees what's in our heart and hears how we do or don't glorify him with our words. In the Old Testament, Proverbs 28.20 in the New American Bible begins with, quote, the trustworthy will be richly blessed, end quote. In the New International Version, it starts with, quote, a faithful man will be richly blessed, end quote. Friends, the message here is we must avoid temptation, avoid deceit, and have the same loyalty in our daily life that we should have to our Heavenly Father. Thank you to those of you who have been praying for my aunt, my godmother, who I mentioned, I think, two weeks ago. I talked to my mother last night. It is her sister, and she had a pretty good report, finally. The day after this episode comes out, my aunt is going to see an endocrinologist, so we would all be grateful for continued healing prayers. I want to talk to the people who are in a different generation than my aunt, though. You're young. You don't go to the doctor that often, yet health insurance is still so expensive. If your health insurance costs too much, maybe you should switch to an affordable alternative. Take charge of your health care with Christian Healthcare Ministries. CHM offers programs starting under $100 per month. Check off the boxes of affordable, faith-based health care and get back to what you really love, running your business or caring for your kids and have peace of mind while doing it. Visit chministries.org slash catholic-radio. Moving on now with this week's episode, my guest ran track in high school, 
competed in intramural sports, later taught himself golf, and coached youth league basketball and baseball, winning a regular season and a postseason title. In 2011, he was ordained to the diaconate in the first class in the Archdiocese of Kansas City in Kansas. He has been a fourth-degree member of the Knights of Columbus, and this year was awarded a licentiate in canon law from St. Paul University in Ottawa, Ontario. He is a board member of Deacons of Hope, a pro-life nonprofit ministry. Welcome to Catholic Sports Radio, Deacon Michael Hill. Thank you, Bruce, for that wonderful and in- in- start to this great interview, I hope. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Let's get started by first having you share with the audience where you were born and raised and what the family size was. So I was born and raised in Overland Park, Kansas. Is my father, my mother, and I have a younger adopted brother. I, too, am adopted. Am I correct that there was difficulty in the delivery when you were born? Do I have that right? Yes, you do. What it is is I was actually born to an unwed mother, and she was uh, in the hospital. They immediately baptized me because they didn't think I was going to make it through the evening. Mm. And eventually I was adopted out to a loving father and mother who are husband and wife. They themselves could not bear children. So wow. I love to tell people that if I was conceived in 1975 instead of 1957, which is simply flipping the last two years of my birth, it's very possible I would not be speaking with you right now. Mm. Was this a Catholic household that you grew up in, by the way? And if so, tell us about the presence of the faith when you were a young boy, including any Catholic education you might have received. Sure. Uh, I was very Catholic. Um, my mother is actually someone who was raised Protestant and then joined the Catholic faith after the marriage that mm. they had. So they made sure that I went to Mass every Sunday and on all, all the holy days of obligation, uh, taught me how to pray, taught me how to say the rosary, then made sure I went to a Catholic elementary school and went there all the way to sixth grade. And then because of transportation issues, I went to a public junior high and high school, but remained in what was back then called CCD. And then eventually went to uh, Rockhurst College, which is a Catholic Jesuit education university now in the Kansas City, Missouri, where I graduated in 1981. On the sports side of things, when did you first start playing sports? Which sports did you play? And who or what got you interested in wanting to start playing sports? So my father played basketball for a fairly famous person named Fog Allen at the University of Kansas. So basketball Hmm. was something that I was exposed to very early in my life. And also he taught me baseball and football because he had been a football star also at Lawrence High School. And so I kind of grew up with all threes just as the sports would rotate. We would rotate learning and talking about them. (laughs) Then uh, he was also pretty good at track, and so I started to run track uh, specifically in high school. So uh, that was one place where I was able to excel because I had pretty good speed. And because of the fact I'm a little smaller because I was born in November, so before they had this rule about September, uh, you, you waited another year if you were born after September 1st here in Kansas. I was usually one of the smaller people in my class, so although I probably had the talent, I didn't have the height and the build because everybody was about a year older than uh. me, so that's why I ended up playing intramurals rather than anything else. And also that's why being able to run track you know, was good because it was an individual sport within a team environment. Ah, uh, okay, okay. I want to fast forward ahead to the years that you coached youth league basketball and baseball as much as i mentioned in the intro that you won a regular season and a postseason title rather than trying to earn trophies you actually saw that role as an opportunity to accomplish something else with those student athletes share with the audience that perspective sure um so what i would do when i was coaching them i would try to find maybe an area where they hadn't received any training where god had given them a gift to do, and maybe somebody hadn't seen it or somebody hadn't explored that yet. And so I would take my time and, and teach them and say, hey, you, you can do this really well. You can do that really well. That seems to be a gift from God. And when we coached, I always made sure that I didn't look at the scoreboard. I said, you know, I don't care if you win or lose. Did you play your best? Did you do your best? Did you hustle as much as you could? 
you know, I'd be forgiving of errors, especially at that age, because sometimes they try too hard. Mm. But it was always about trying to find a way where I could incorporate God and the gifts that God had given these young children to play and then give them encouragement. One thing that I saw when I was growing up was I had a baseball coach myself who refused to coach his own son. His Mm. own son was probably the best player in our league but he refused to coach his own son. And because he refused to coach his own son, his son had a better time and enjoyed the sport more. And also he then wasn't accused of playing favorites. Ah. Now I was not blessed with children, neither my wife nor I have any children, but I always said I had 12 girls or 12 boys or 15 (laughs) girls and 15 boys, depending on the sport and how many I had because I said these became quote unquote my children. So I would look after them, but I would do it in a different way. I would sit there and somebody would say, I'd say good cop rather than bad cop. And being good cop, I would say, Hey, you can do this. You know, let me give you some encouragement. And I found out later on that a lot of those children that I coached were then able to say, Hey, this reinforced what mom and dad said. This is somebody who really shouldn't care. That's interesting because I had two follow-up questions for you, and one of them was going to be, did you get pushback from parents saying, why aren't you just giving it everything to make sure that these kids win instead of, hey, I'm not looking at the scoreboard? The other question was going to be, you know, what influenced you to develop that approach to coaching, to saying, I'm not going to look at the scoreboard. I just want to make sure the kids are having a good experience here and giving it their all. Mm -hmm. Well, I I took my coaching philosophy from a gentleman named John Wooden who coached UCLA. Mm -hmm. And a lot of his books, he talked about, you know, I just want to sit in the stands like a fan and watch and see how good a job I did preparing the team to play this game without worrying about the score. Did they run the play the way they were supposed to run it? Did each player kind of do what they were supposed to do? Were they in the right position at the right time? And that was kind of the philosophy I took into my basketball and into my baseball coaching wise, because I said, okay, I had a pitcher out there one day who was not, his form was wrong. He kept missing the, the, uh, the plate and then actually endangering other players because of the fact <laughs> he was so wild. And I said, I don't want anything bad to happen to the other team's player either. So I said, I yelled at him. I said, would you just extend your arm and snap your wrist, which is his normal throw. Mm-hmm. He immediately did it and started throwing strikes again mm. and starting the ball started moving like it normally did. And at the end of the inning, he came in and he said, thanks for yelling that coach. Wow. And that meant a lot to me because I think he was out there struggling and I didn't want to embarrass him by calling time out and going out there, Yeah. but I could yell something from the side. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, those are, those are the things you can kind of do when it's not about the score. It's about how can I coach him so he can use God's gifts to him in a much better way. And I think you said that the parents did appreciate the approach that you took. So I think the answer to my question is no, you didn't really get much pushback. Am I correct? No, very little pushback. Um, I think I had one parent over the years who was kind of wondering why I was yelling at the kids. And my wife, who happened to be sitting right next to her, said, did you hear what he's yelling? He's Mm. not yelling at them. He's yelling encouragement to them. He's giving them positive reinforcement that you're doing the right thing. It just didn't work out because, you know, that's sometimes what happens is sometimes you've just got the other teams got a better player than you've got. And he or she makes a play that even though you were in the right position and, and did the right thing or, you know, you were in the right position to take the throw and you caught it and you stepped on the base and you went to throw it to first base and the guy who just beat it to first base, he was just too fast. Everything you did, everything perfectly. It just you just didn't get the double play. Yeah, or yeah. you didn't get the force out because he got to second base before you got to second base. And those are the kind of things that, you know, once the parents understood what I was doing was trying to coach them up rather than being negative Nelly, that becomes very easy for them then to say, okay, he's not yelling at my child. An audience, if you'll just show a little grace to to both myself and to Deacon Michael Hill, I know he has two stories that he wants to share with us. So while we're here in this coaching part of his life and the stories he's telling, I wanted to let him tell those two stories. And I promise we're going to move on because we've got a lot more that that we're going to cover. But (laughs) please go ahead, Deacon, Mm -hmm. and, and share those two stories that you have. 
Yeah. So the first one I always call is, is called Tommy in the free throws. And Tommy was one of the players who wasn't a starter. He was someone who sat on the bench a lot. And it was a game where it was really close down to the end. And I had one of my better players had four fouls and we were very tight game. And I wanted him to be the other player to be able to be eligible for the overtime. Mm. And cause I knew that he would be a very good player against this other really good player. One thing I didn't say is I can't hear in my left ear. I can only hear in my right ear. And I happen to be sitting to the right of the other team. Mm. And all of a sudden for no reason at all, I see an official blow his whistle and I kind of look up at him and he gives the technical foul sign and he points at the other team's bench. Well, I look out at my players because now I've got to shoot two free throws with three seconds left in the game. And I look and I got four guys and we've all seen it. When a player gets tired, he grabs the bottom of his shorts and bends over yeah. almost, you know, like in an L shape. Yeah. And they're all looking at me like, okay, who am I going to call to do it? And I look over at Tommy and Tommy's just standing there like it's a spring afternoon. He's got <laughs> all this energy and everything. And I'm going, you know, in practice, he makes these free throws. I'm going to give him a chance. Mm. So I said, Tommy, shoot the free throws. And he looks at me like I've lost my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but I send him to the free throw line. I said, Tommy, you know, shoot the free throws. And I just leave it at that. He goes up, bounces the ball three times, look at the basket and just kind of flips it at the basket. It hits the right side of the rim, the backboard and falls off. Mm. And he looks over like I'm going to pull him off the line. And I yell at him, Tommy, would you make this free throw so we can all go home? <laughs> we want to watch the Chiefs play. <laughs> and this time he's very serious. He goes bouncy, bouncy, bouncy. Just like practice shoots it. It is as pure a swish as I've ever seen on a free throw. Mm. Now we're up one point with three seconds to go. I pull him out. I go, I'm going to put my better player in. So I run him into the scorer's bench. He comes back. And we end up defending the other team, and they don't get a shot off at the end of the game. We win 31-30. to 30. Wow. Shake hands. Everybody goes home. A month later, I run into Tommy's parents in the back of church. And they said, hey, have you heard about Tommy? And I'm thinking, this is usually not good news. This is probably bad news. Yeah. I said, what's wrong with Tommy? Almost exactly like that. And they said, oh, no, Mike, it's good. It's good. Okay. I said, what happened? He said, remember when he hit that free throw? I said, I'm probably never going to forget it. And obviously, it's 30 years later. I still haven't <laughs> forgot it. And he says, no, it's great. He said, when he went back to school, he stopped being picked on. He stopped being teased. Mm. His grades went up a full letter grade in every subject in his school. Oh, my gosh. And he was, quote, unquote, one of the guys. Oh, my gosh. Fantastic. Fantastic. What it was is he then believed in himself, too, because, mm. as I said earlier, this is somebody who got positive reinforcement for somebody who really shouldn't care, his yeah. basketball coach. Wow. wow. And he gave him a chance, and he came through, and he went on to have a great mm. life. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And the second story that you have? The second story I call the tuxedo story, and it's a different team, but I'm playing. At the start of the year, I always had six rules and something at the bottom that I always gave to the parents for the kids about, i like you for to be at the game. Feel free to come into the practices. So, you know, you know, just total transparency. Mm -hmm. Please make sure if your kid's sick, please let me know in advance. Da, 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 da. I try to give everybody about the same amount of time, but you really can't guarantee that, yada, yada. And the last one is for your child. If I coach the championship game, if we're in the finals and I coach the championship game, I will coach it in a tuxedo. <laughs> Now, I use that as kind of a carrot to get the kids to play their best. <laughs> that was it. I never thought I'd ever have to pay this off. <laughs> we're in the semifinals of the year that I win the championship. And we're down six with 30 seconds to go. Oh, gosh. I call timeout. I'm thinking, well, they played a great season. So I call them over. I said, okay, we've got this press. Let's use the press. Let's go out there. Let's do what we're supposed to do. Let's get this as close as we can. If we get it to overtime, I'm going to be really happy. And one of my players goes, hey, yeah, we want to see Coach in a tuxedo, don't we? Let's go do this. Well, he's yelling this at the top of his lungs in a small gym. Mm. And all these parents behind me, you just start hearing this murmuring back and forth. like this, you know. And then the guys go, break. And I go, break. And they all yell, tuxedo. And I'm going, uh-oh, this stuck. We scored eight points in the last 30 seconds, wow. won the game by two. Wow. It is an absolute miracle because wow. I never called a timeout. 
I never called the timeout. They just oh kept turning them over gosh. right underneath the basket, making the shot, did exactly what we coached them to do, and they ended up scoring eight points, won the game. The next day, I'm at church because this is now a Sunday, and I've got players coming to, up to me because I'm just dressed, you know, normal, casual, polo shirt, yeah. dressed slacks. And they go, where's the tuxedo? Where's the tuxedo? I said, <laughs> sitting at home. We go to the gym, and I get there an hour before we're supposed to start. And I sit where all the players, when they first walk into the gym, can look up and see me. Because I want them to see, A, I've paid it off, and B, they're going to last, so they're all going to relax. <laughs> As I'm walking with the basketballs and my bottles of water with my wife to go sit in the top row of that gym, I see other parents reach into their pockets on the other teams and start pulling out money because they had bet I wouldn't do it. Uh. <laughs> anyway, we end up winning the game 31-30 uh, where a kid hit a free throw right toward the end of the game to win. In fact, I just saw him. His father passed away here earlier this week mm. and uh, got to see Andrew. And An Andrew hit the free throw after the other kid who fouled him, who was a good friend of his joked wow. with him that you're going to miss both of these. We're going to go to overtime. And he got really mad and <laughs> made it. Wow. But wow. in those cases, I didn't care about the score. It was all about the yeah. kids. It was about making sure the kids had a positive experience yeah. and the kids learned how to be better people. I love it. And I, I always made it. sure they shook hands and always wished well to the other team. Because I said, if you've played hard and you've used God's talents to the best of your ability, you can look that other person in the eye and shake their hand and congratulate them then knowing you did the best you could to win the game, but it, it just wasn't supposed to be. Fantastic. Fantastic. And audience, thank you for your grace. I know we're running long. I, I'm looking at the timeline already, and this is longer than, than it usually takes to get. We're not even at the halfway point, so uh, we'll go a little faster. But thank you, because I, I, I knew that Deacon Mike was going to have some good stories to tell there, and I think you saw some some great lessons in both of those stories. So let's fast forward. Uh, 13 years ago, you were ordained to the diaconate. Take us through how you felt the call as well as how you knew that it was a yes, because I think your discernment period was really fast. Yeah, uh, it, it could be a little quick. Uh, it started when we lived in Iowa for a while, where I was kind of approached by a deacon there, but we moved back to Kansas City. So that was back in the mid-'80s, and then I came back to Kansas City, and there was no diaconate program at the time. Oh. And I lived a Curcio weekend in 2004, March, and um, after the retreat, uh, we had a meeting, where somebody else was there and they casually mentioned that their priest had said, Hey, there's this permanent diaconate program. And my wife and I talked about it. And so I filled out all the forms and everything like that. I called the office and filled out the forms and called my pastor and he answered the phone at nine o'clock at night. Hmm. And I told him what was going on. He says, uh, yeah, right. You know, he kind of laughs. And I'm thinking this is the shortest discernment in the history of the Catholic church. But come to find out, he was about ready to call me the next day to see if I'd heard about it and if I was interested. Oh, my gosh. So I went into his office, and he, he took the form, signed it, reached into his top drawer, and picked out an already created letter of recommendation for me and then personally delivered it to the chancery. And then six years later, I was ordained, and wow. he is actually serving a neighborhood parish right now. And I'm the spiritual advisor to the Curcio Movement in the Archdiocese, and he's my associate. Wow. Wow. So, you know, we all know how it goes, right, folks? You're you're praying about something, you're trying to discern, and, and we all do it. We're all guilty of it. I'm holding up air quotes. You look for a sign. And my gosh, if that wasn't a Hallmark card right there saying you're doing the right thing, you're in the right place. I mean, clearly, Mike, you heard and answered the call and didn't even need the affirmation because it came so quickly you're in your heart. You already knew that that that's where you needed to be next in in your faith walk was in the diaconate. Exactly, and you know it it wasn't this smooth sail either. I mean, I had doubts. You know, Satan picked on me all the time, mm. and as my spiritual advisor said, obviously there's something great God wants you to do, mm. and Satan's trying to thwart you. Wow. So I've always kind of kept that in, in the back of my mind that, wow. you know, if you do see a sign and you do really feel God's calling you this way and doors open and everything happens, then for sure, for sure, you're going that way and just abide. 
Yeah, and look out because Satan's going to be around every corner trying to block your you path there. Wow. Folks, if you did not hear last week's interview with Stephen Thomas, who wrote the book Catholic Joe Superhero, go back and listen to that. He even talked about having walked with 11 other guys. I'm, I'm pausing for dramatic effect, so you go 12. Walked approximately 4,500 miles in the form of a cross across the United States. He also mentioned, Small World, that he knows Steve Pocorny, who runs Catholic-based Freedom Coaching. What is Freedom Coaching? Well, from Little League to college-age student-athletes to the pros, there is always an element of a player looking up to their coach to learn from that individual who has the team's best interests at heart. The coaches who work with individuals that have a compulsion to pornography as part of Freedom Coaching do it because they have their best interests at heart. They want to help them improve. Visit freedom-coaching.net today to learn more, and do please let them know that you heard about Freedom Coaching on Catholic Sports Radio. Deacon Michael Hill is my guest, and we've got lots more to cover, including what Deacons of Hope is, what NFL team he is a season ticket holder for, and more. But first, if you missed it, Last week, we celebrated the milestone 300th episode of this show. My continued thanks to everyone who listens to this show. Please tell others about it. I'm always reading so many different reports from across the podcasting industry. And when they talk about getting a bigger audience for your show, there's always mention made about how influential word of mouth is. So whether you simply tell someone about Catholic Sports Radio or text them a link or email them a link, or use the share feature that a lot of different podcast apps have these days. It's going to help tremendously. We are all a part of this ministry, not just me as the host, and not just the people that I interview each week as the guest. Think of where our parishes would be if everyone sat back and said, no, the priests are there, they'll take care of everything. That's why people like Michael Hill become deacons. It's why there are ministries within each parish. It's why there are ushers, altar servers, and so many other people giving their time and talent to be a part of the church. In the same way, I ask you, as part of this ministry, to consider Catholic Sports Radio as part of your tithing. Let's make sure that this show can get out to more and more people, and then I can keep up with the bills that come in for various expenses that you so often hear me detailing on numerous episodes of this show. Guests and listeners alike have made a financial gift to this ministry, which is part of how we were able to get to a milestone like last week's 300th episode. I trust that this is helping you in your faith life and you believe in the mix of faith and sports and that you see value in not only the work that I do week after week, month after month, year after year, all without getting any income from doing this show, but that you also see this as a resource to help draw people closer to Christ. Please prayerfully consider utilizing the blue Donate to CSR button that's on the homepage of catholicsportsradio.net. Yes, or .com. They'll both get you to the same place. That blue button is a fast, easy, and secure way to make a financial gift. It will allow you to use a credit card, debit card, or even PayPal. Alternatively, though, if you prefer, since I know some people don't like putting payment information on the Internet, you can get in touch with me through social media, the website, or email, for details on sending a check through the mail, bruce at catholicsportsradio.net is how you can write to me. Regardless of which method you use, the blue Donate to CSR button on the website or sending me a check, with your permission, I will happily say your name on the air on an upcoming episode of the show as a public thanks, as you heard me do as recently as two weeks ago in thanking a listener who had made a gift through the website. Or as some people have instructed me to do, you can ask to remain anonymous. I'm grateful for your considering Catholic Sports Radio as part of your tithing as I continue working to move more people closer to Christ through the mix of faith and sports. Deacon Mike, before all that, you told us your story about your call to the diaconate. While you were in a Catholic environment for higher education, I'm talking about Rockhurst College, which is Jesuit, help us connect the dots because it was this year that you were awarded a licentiate in canon law from St. Paul University in Ottawa, Ontario, no less. So walk us through all that, because that's an almost 43-year gap between graduating from college in Missouri 
to getting a licentiate in canon law from a university in Canada? Well, the, the middle point in all this is actually my diaconal discernment. Part of your diaconal discernment involves taking courses in canon law. It is a simple course where they kind of do a high-level overview of canon law and how it applies to the church. Well, the person who was the moderator of our diaconal formation was actually the judicial vicar for the archdiocese at the time. And I was able to follow along and ask good questions and do the papers that were assigned to those courses. He kind of intimated to me in his own way that, you know, maybe you, you've got something there. Maybe you need to look into this. Mm. And so I put it aside for a while because I said, well, I've got to complete the uh, diaconal courses. Mm. But when I came out of it, the pastor of my parish said, I want you to take over our CIA. You know, that's something deacons do is they do our CIA. And I said, okay. And he says, now you're going to have annulments. So you're going to have to get those. And so I started filling out the annulment paperwork for people who are coming into the church, which is required for anybody who's got in an irregular marriage or has a prior marriage. And those cases went right through the system and came right out the other end very, very quickly. And because I had understood what was needed and got it done. And then eventually we got to a situation where he retired and another priest came in and took over his JV. And I happened to run into him while I was in a meeting and I just gone to confession with him. And I said, okay, confession's over. I said, okay, what do you got? I said, do you need help? He says, I desperately need help. Mm. And I said, okay, let's talk when we get back home. Because we were up in Omaha, Nebraska. Came back home, met with him. We looked at places, and he put my name in, and Archbishop Nauman about a year later says, go for it. And so did COVID. Mm. So the first three years was pretty much all remote because of uh, the COVID situation. Everything was shut down. So I did those years, and then uh, we'd go up for about maybe six weeks at the end. But I ended up getting the licentiate last June, and uh, also got a nine-hour course training in what's called CPCS, which is Child Protection and Child Safety. Mm. So that's you know, sex abuse and understanding what goes into it and you know what could cause this and, and warning signs, basically. So for those that are familiar about Virtus, it's like Virtus, but up a couple of levels. And now I'm the defender of the bonds of the archdiocese. And that sort of segues nicely into audience in May of last year, back on episode 222 of this show, my guest was Deacon Kevin Cummings, the co-founder of Deacons of Hope. I encourage you to go back and listen to that interview if you never heard it, but Deacon Mike, you are a recent addition as a board member for Deacons of Hope. Please go ahead and share about that nonprofit pro-life ministry. Sure. The Archdiocese probably has one of the greatest proponents, if not the greatest proponent ever, of life, which is Archbishop Joseph Nauman. Mm. And his motto literally translates, life will be victorious. Mm. And he lives this every day. And Deacon Kevin Cummings, who you just referenced, met up with me at our annual retreat last year, and he asked me if I would want to join up. And I knew that my canon law time studies were coming to an end, and I told him, I think I can help. And so he had me join on with him. And so over the past few months, I've created a database with content information for all of the diocese and archdiocese. So I've got like the deacon director and the vocations director for all of them. And we've got that on a spreadsheet. And we're going to begin hopefully contacting these people to see because our goal is now to raise awareness and get greater involvement among the deacons and the vocations directors all across the United States. Because what we see are deacons get ordained and they're ordained for several years. And then often when they start, they're told you know, what their assignment's going to be. You're going to go do prison ministry. You're going to do homebound ministry. You're going to do, you know, end of life ministry. Well, things change after a while. People, you know, either think they've done all they can and there's really nothing else they can do. And so they want to remain active, and they just kind of need something new to relight that, I call it diaconal fire that you get at ordination. So Deacons of Hope is designed so deacons can find the need, find others interested in helping, and then bring the gospel to the need and align those you know, up with others. And they help those in need by offering time and talent opportunities, because often treasure is abundant. 
people will donate money. We don't necessarily want money. What we want is somebody who's got some time and who's got some talent. And the other thing too is, is at that point we can step back and help oversee and support and maybe pass it off to a lay person and go on to something else. And the advantage to this, of course, is understanding that there's no politics involved in this. So it doesn't matter whether it's Democrat, Republican, Independent. This is the Catholic Church through her deacons who live both the clerical and lay lives coming to the needs of all God's children, not just Catholics. So one of the things we have right now is this is not just about stopping abortions, but also providing resources to the woman who has the child so that future she dreamed of prior to the pregnancy can still be achieved. It's opening a food kitchen for the homeless so they can have a place to eat and be in a safe, controlled environment when the weather's bad. It's creating a clothing store where donations of goods can be provided to the less fortunate so they can begin to restore their human dignity. It's setting up voluntary medical, dental, even surgical services to those in need so their health issues can be addressed and it's getting prescription drug medications to those who need them but can't afford them. So we work with doctors and dentists. I like that you're giving this list because, audience, I don't want you to tune out and say, he's only talking to deacons, he's only looking for deacons, because there are ways, Deacon Mike, that you're saying that parishioners can get involved at their parish, and it might be asking the deacon at their parish, are you aware of this organization called Deacons of Hope? But there's also opportunities for them to get involved that, like you say, could they donate money? Sure, but there's other things they could do to help out Deacons of Hope. And so, folks, on the show page for this episode on catholicsportsradio.net, I'm going to put a link to the Deacons of Hope website so you can go there and read more about them, see about getting involved, link over to their Facebook page, make contact, and so on. For those of you who have not heard me talk about it before— or have not seen it on the Catholic Sports Radio website. Five years ago, I lived my Curcio weekend. You heard Deacon Mike mention it previously during this conversation. Deacon Mike, you are a Curciista as well. Go ahead and share with the audience about the Curcio movement for those who aren't familiar with that. That'd be great. Thank you for the opportunity. Curcio is a three-day lived experience. Men live it alone and women live it alone. So it's two different retreats, one for men, one for women. It begins on Thursday night where you have an opportunity to listen to a meditation, do an examination of conscience, then go and receive the sacrament of reconciliation. On Friday, you end up encountering yourself a little bit. You learn about your ideals. And there's 13 talks that go on through the weekend. And there's opportunities in there for you to share with other people at your table and with other people in the room. And what you're actually doing is practicing a methodology that allows you to get better at your prayer, get better at studying, and get better at evangelizing your environment. And your environment is the people you're with in your parish, the people you run into at the grocery store, the people you run into on the highway. Not literally, but, I mean, they pass you. <laughs> And it's an ongoing commitment that you have that ends on Sunday night when we close down the weekend. And the beauty of this is, is you become self-sufficient or more self-sufficient in understanding what the Catholic Church truly teaches. And through that methodology, you not only share where you found something, but they share back with you. And what that does is it says, hey, I can take care of this and pull that maybe a little bit off of your pastor, or you become more knowing about what the church teaches and how the church operates, so you get yourself into a situation where you're far more effective in your parish. And that is really the goal of the entire program, is to make you a better Catholic and a better Christian. Yeah, amen. And there's some great, I'm going to call it accountability, too, because every month there are mm -hmm. Altrea meetings, and I understand, audience, that not every church program is for everybody. You do have to try a bunch of them and see which one you really find yourself to attached to. I, in particular, had a wonderful, wonderful experience in the Curcio movement. Uh, I had gone on a men's Emmaus weekend. It didn't do anything for me. It doesn't mean that Emmaus is not worth your time if you've never done it before. Uh, but that's my point, is that you try different things and you find the one that really resonates with you and uh, the Curcio movement I just found to be wonderful. 
We're in the home stretch. I just have two final questions and we'll wrap up. But this one I have to do. I was told, Deacon Mike, that not only are you a Kansas City Chiefs season ticket holder, but a long time Kansas City Chiefs season ticket holder and a diehard Kansas City Chiefs fan. So go ahead, bask in their success. Tell us about your being an ardent supporter. And of course, can they win the Super Bowl again at the end of this season, honestly? Well, I will tell you this. I remember watching Super Bowl one. Wow. 1967 wow. on TV. My father was transferred to Cleveland on a temporary assignment. So literally during Super Bowl four, I had to break away and take my father to the airport with my mother. <laughs> so I missed most of Super Bowl four. I've seen it on tape. Uh, we bought season tickets when we moved back from Iowa back here to Kansas City. In fact, I like to tell people we bought chief season tickets and tickets to Starlight Theater for date nights. And then we bought a house so we'd have somewhere to send the tickets to. <laughs> but um, can they, you know, I will bask a little bit in the glow in that, unfortunately, because of my diaconate, one of the things you had to sacrifice was my chief season ticket. So, oh no! unfortunately, that was the year the Chiefs had drafted some kid named Patrick Mahomes out of Texas Tech, and <laughs> I guess he's okay. <laughs> but we still watch him every weekend. We're on, on TV here at home. We're going to try to get out to a game here pretty soon. Sometime we'll pay their freight and go out. Now, whether they can pull the three-peat off or not, I don't know. My hope is they can, but you know what? This is a heck of a run. This is a heck of a run. And when even the one they lost when they lost to Tampa Bay, you know, that's still a heck of an achievement to get there even then. So, you know, go Chiefs, and uh, maybe, just maybe, we will get that elusive three-peat. To understand how hard this is, realize that New England Patriots – twice won two in a row and couldn't get the third one. So, you know, God willing, they get it. But if not, we're still going to be pretty good. Yeah. And in this day and age of any given Sunday and we see the parody, it makes it that mm-hmm. much more of a steep climb to to the potential three-peat. Let's close by having you share about your wife, how long the two of you have been in the sacrament of holy matrimony. I know that she had some involvement with the church as well. Please enlighten us on on your marriage. Sure. As I said, I graduated from college on December 18th, 1981, and we got married on December 19th, 1981. And that's a whole nother story. But we were married then. She has been an organist now for over 50 years. Wow. She still plays, plays very well. So we were married in, in St. Peter's Cathedral, which is where I'm assigned right now. So that mm. first homily I gave there, I, I, I reminded everybody that you know, this is where I got married, so I'm I'm part of this place be- even from back then because wow. that was her home church. So you're coming up on 43 years, it sounds like, if I'm doing the math properly. You are correct. Wow. Yeah, 43 in December. Wow. So six weeks from now, it'll be 43 years. And, you know, it's it's been a blessing. It seems like five, mm. you know, but that's what it's like when you really allow God to go work in your marriage. The years click off, and, you know, we've been blessed that, you know, we've been able to be together for 43 years, and, and God has really blessed us even without children because we have 27 nieces and nephews that just love it when Aunt Jen and Uncle Mike show up. <laughs> did you meet her because of the church, or is it where did you get that from, Bruce? Not even close. Yeah, no, 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 definitely it was. We were mentioning Curcio here just a few minutes ago. Their search, which was in a 1970s kind of search type retreat or Curcio type retreat of search. And so she was working backup. She was support and I was support. And we met on there. Mm. And then we just kind of parted ways. And a month later, they had a group, a get together of everybody that was on there. And she said she walked into the room and she said she heard bells and she saw me. Mm. And we went out to, got alone together there for a while and uh, ended up getting married three years later and been happy ever since. Outstanding. Outstanding. I love a happy ending. And folks, stick with me because, as you know, whenever I have a member of the clergy on, I always defer to them. And Deacon Mike has agreed to do the closing prayer. But first, let me just formally thank you, Deacon Mike, for being on Catholic Sports Radio. God bless you and your wife. And I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for making time to be on the show today. Absolutely, Bruce. This was great, and I really appreciate it. And blessings on you and blessings on Catholic Sports Radio. Thank you. This is a tremendous thing that you're doing. 
and it's kind of unique. And I think that people understanding that there's something bigger than the football game or the baseball game or the basketball game. There's appreciating the talent that God has given these people to do these things to keep us entertained and distracted for an hour or two or three Amen. is really important, especially in the society we're in right now. Amen. Amen. And so, Deacon Mike, on that, I will defer to you if you could close us out with a prayer, please. Sure can. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we ask blessings on your church here in this time in the United States and around the world. May we find the ways to heal the divisions and through the synodality process, learn to listen to each other with respect and love. We pray to Almighty God that he send grace upon all those who hear this message that all of us as Catholics can become one again as you are one with God, Jesus. In this we pray, our Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy will will be done, done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And God bless all listeners who hear this podcast. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. This is Catholic Sports Radio. Find more at catholicsportsradio.net, as well as on Facebook, X, and Instagram. It is at Cath Sports Radio on all those. C-A-T-H, at Cath Sports Radio. I'm Bruce Wozniak, and remember, it's not whether you win or lose, it's that it's Jesus that you always choose.